Recently, I did a poll on my community page and 75% of you have responded saying you would like me to not only just review products, but also to make some discussion videos. Now, with most of us stuck at home for the past year due to COVID, I would guess most of you probably have already depleted your wallet buying hi-fi gear and also bought tons of stuff that you don't really need. So it would make sense that some of you are no longer interested in watching review videos, but rather watch something else. Now, for those of you who follow me, you know, I like to share from time to time my experiences and stories. So yeah, let's do it today. Once upon a time, I decided to do an experiment. I invited my audio file buddies over on different days to audition five speakers. It was not a real blind test, but I call it semi-blind test because I did not tell them the price of each speaker, neither the brand. Now, most of them did not know what speakers they were listening to. And I think the only speaker some of them recognized was the Kef LS50. I did the test for curiosity because I was curious and I wanted to know if most of them would choose the most expensive speaker over the least. After all, more money should buy you better performance and I always believe you get what you paid for. So there were eight audio files that participated in my torture test. Torture test. You know how long it takes to listen to five speakers? That's a few hours of their life they're never getting back. The five speakers were the Wolf Dell D225, about 500 bucks USD. The Kef LS50, 1001. The Kabas Minolka MC40, about 1003. The Totem Sky, about 1007. And the Revell M106, around 2200 USD. By the way, you have to forgive me for the B rolls in this video. I know it's terrible because it was shot a long time ago. I drove all five speakers with the same electronics the Exasound E28 DAC the Montreux LS100 tube preamp, and the Moon 5.3 Class AB 150 watt power amp. The stack has a MSRP of around $10,000. And I chose that because I did not want the electronics to be the bottleneck. Now I would swap speakers after playing a few tracks and kept the speaker stand at the same place, but I would try to level match the volume. The test was simple. I asked everyone to choose their favorite speaker and that's it. So did most of them choose the most expensive 2,200 bucks Revell M106? Not even close. Only two of them did. Every speaker got chosen as a favorite and that includes the least expensive Wolf Dell D225. So can we conclude more expensive does not equal better? No, to be frank, the analyst in me knows there are problems with this test and it is not conclusive. Now, I'll explain as I go through this video. And despite the test has its problems, I still did it for fun. So after each listening session, I would spend a lot of time discussing with my buddies our findings. I have to say, I am blessed to have met so many audiophiles. And one thing I noticed is when audiophiles meet, even if they don't know each other, they can chat for hours. Anyways, the test did make me realize a few things. The first thing, uh, well, if you meet as many audio files in real life as I do, you'll quickly realize this audio stuff, okay? It's all a question of taste. I remember originally when I first started a test, I had Mr. DIY, well, I call him Mr. DIY because he made his own speakers, gave each speaker a score. Now, and although the Totem Sky did not score the highest, he liked the Totem Sky the most because of the tonality. Now, eventually I got rid of the scorecard because it was just too time consuming. Instead, I told people just choose their favorite speaker. Now, behind the scene, Mr. Quan actually at one point also created a score sheet for me. And here, let me put it up on screen. He'll break down whatever he listens to into different categories like soundstage speed, detail, upper mid range and so forth. And then he'll score it. Guess what? His favorite DAC, for example, did not come close scoring the highest. Now, Mr. Vintage bought the Kabas after listening to these five speakers because he likes how balanced the Kabas presentation is. Guess what? Mr. Vintage taste is he doesn't like V-curve, but he likes a more neutral presentation. 
So his favorite speaker was voice close to his taste. Tony chose the Revell speakers. Interestingly, the Revell has a waveguide, and it just so happens that Tony owns a pair of JBL with horns. Coincidence or a question of taste? The second thing I realized, synergy and setup are so important. You see, the most expensive Revell speaker actually sounded better with a different amp than the Moon amp that was used in the test. Now, when I drove the Revell with one of my Class D amps, it sounded significantly better. So while I was doing the test, I was telling myself, damn, the Revell is not performing at its best. So it's not a fair fight. Also, to get each speaker to perform its best, I need to find the best position to place it, which I did not. My realization, never underestimate system matching. The KLH Model 5 speaker I have here, when I drive it with the Cayenne CS88, I want to turn it off. But when I drive it with the Macintosh 6700, I'm in audio heaven. That big of a difference. Now, since we're on the topic of synergy, let me tell you about Mr. Quad and Kev, okay? Before meeting me, Mr. Quad hates Kev and Focal. Too bright for him. So when we were listening to the fine speakers, he was shocked how well the Kev LS50 sounded. Not bright at all and really pleasant. He actually chose that as his favorite speaker because of the shock factor. So as you can see, equipment matching is so important. Now later on, I lent him my Focal 1008 BE speaker. That speaker has a Berlin tweeter and it is, it is revealing. To his surprise at his home, when he paired it with the Doge 7, 8 and Purify Class D amp, it sounded magnificent. I remember receiving a text from him telling me he was really surprised how good the Focal speakers sounded. A few days later, I got another text from him. This time, he changed the Purify Class D amp to his Macintosh 670, well, just the amp section, okay, the front end still Doge. And he was like, man, it's too bright. Yeah, cool story. I thought I would share. So let's move on to the last thing I realized with this experiment. Now, given that our taste plays an important role in choosing our favorite speaker, it stands to reason it is important we need to be able to identify what we like. If I ask what is the best family sedan under 20,000, some would choose Civic while others would choose Corolla, Forte, Jetta, and so on. There is no best in this case because everyone would choose based on what they defined as the best. If I define the best as reliability and fuel economy, I then probably can narrow it down to two cars. If acceleration and cornering is most important to me, I doubt I would choose the Corolla. My point is, once you specify what is most important to you, a few best choices do exist, well, at a specific price point. You see, after the speaker experiment, which was done like a few years ago, whenever I get asked for advice on what is the best speaker to buy, uh, for example, I always tell them to narrow it down to two or three priorities well, after you decide on a budget. The more precise, the better. Let me give you an example. If you tell me you want a $600-ish speaker that has a wide sound stage, I can give you three choices right away. The Manapan LRS, the Cabas Antigua, and the Sound Artist SC6. That is one specification. Now, if you add one more and say, you don't want a V-curve and you want a mid-range that has a lot of body and not recessed, I can eliminate the Sound Artist and I'm left with the Manapan LRS and the Cabas Antigua. Finally, if you say the speaker must be easy to drive, I can eliminate the LRS right away. So in this case, a best candidate does exist as long as you specify your condition and price. You know those five speakers I tested? When I asked those eight audiophiles, which one is the brightest and sharpest? Yeah, most of them can narrow it down to two speakers. So those three things are what I took away and I know for those of you who follow me, you have heard it a million times when I say it is all a question of taste. I just wanted to share the story with you and explain why I have such a point of view. It's events like this that have shaped my opinion. Now, I will finish the video with an advice. When you watch reviews, don't focus on if the reviewer loves the product or not, but rather focus on 
what are the product strengths the reviewer has pointed out. If the strength matches your priorities, that is all that matters. I can tell you I love X speakers, and unless you have the exact same taste as me, it is meaningless. Let me tell you about Mr. Vintage. Now, I gave him this nickname because he mostly plays with budget vintage gear these days. At one point, he actually owned a few systems, the price of a house. If you ever meet him, he's yeah, a really nice and down-to-earth guy. Now, Mr. Vintage is like an audiophile mentor to me, and he pointed out to me really early in my audio journey that taste and synergy is really important. Fortunately, I understood this, while well, partially due to this speaker experiment, and I realized that my taste is very different than his. I like V-curve, with sharp, bright top treble and punchy bass, while he likes a more neutral presentation, where everything is not exaggerated. You know, the other day he told me, what I like is like fry fish with heavy MSG, while what he likes is steamed fish with light seasoning. So when Mr. Vintage tests something out for me and he tells me it is good, I get excited because he is really good at recognizing good stuff. For example, the upcoming SMSL A1 Class A amp. However, when he says he loves it and wants to buy it, that is when I tell my other friend Mr. Cantor, oh no man, red flag. Because things that Mr. Vintage loves is usually not something I would love. Sure, I can appreciate and can enjoy it, but rarely do I love what he loves. That is why when I watch YouTube videos, I don't care if the YouTuber is over the moon for the product or not. I just pay attention to the two top positive things that he mentioned. If it matches my priorities, I put it on an audi my audition list, as long as the negatives are not deal breaker. So with that, let's end the video. And if you enjoyed today's video, please subscribe and hit the notification bell, else you will not get notified with my latest release. Now, strangely, in my latest uh, Fluence video, a few of you mentioned you were not notified of it. So I will put a link for that video in the first comment. I know a lot of stuff I talk about today, most of you already know, and to some extent, me too, before doing the experiment. The experiment, however, did help me organize my thoughts. And it was really fruitful for me, especially after each edition session, I would have a productive discussion with my buddies. Yeah, I think that is it for today. You know, I should start a playlist. Thomas and Audiophile Bedtime Stories. Perfect for those who have a hard time falling asleep. Okay, guys, I'll see you next time. Nailed it.